walking through something right now. We may be walking through something, but we are not alone. We have that assurance that God is right, right here, right beside us. He never lets us go. May this song give you peace in the midst of your storm. of the shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear and even when i'm caught in the middle of the storms of his life i won't turn back i know you are near Still I will praise you Still I will praise you 
Francisco. And thank you for that grace, that amazing grace that you give us. We don't deserve it, God. We stand here amazed and grateful. You loved us that much.
we're going to go and worship God as we study his word. How many are ready to hear the word of the Lord? How many would like to be like Elijah? How many want the faith of Elijah? How many want to, to live a life like Elijah? And so I titled today's message, I Want to Be Like Elijah. Now, what does that mean? If we talk about Elijah, think about who Elijah was. Elijah was this guy in the Old Testament that appears in the New Testament as well. He's a guy that is, is powerful in his actions, powerful in what happens. He's known as the prophet of power. Elijah is one of these guys that I think just about anybody would say, yeah, you know what? If I had to give in and be like somebody in the Bible, I guess I could suffer and be like Elijah. Because he's a guy, and think about it, he's a guy that could pray and change the weather. How many people have seen some of the, the videos or the YouTube shots of people standing on the coast in, uh, in Florida praying against the, the hurricanes? Uh, I mean, think about being a person that you stand and pray and God stops weather. You stand and pray and God brings weather. You stand and pray, and God brings fire from heaven. Now, I think that most of us could say, oh, I think we could live with some kind of power like that. And I believe I need to explain to you something, that you already are living the life of Elijah. Jesus already promised you power. And the thing is, is that we, like Elijah, need to recognize what he is telling us, what God is telling us, and how we're supposed to respond. There are very few people in the world today, believers, that don't know who Elijah is. Elijah is this popular even name that began to circulate. And, and my grandson, his second name is Elijah. Malachi Elijah. And he wants to have power from God. And we need to have this desire to serve the Lord. But what does that mean? What does it mean? I recognize one moment when Elijah is calling fire down from heaven and it appears that everything is going his way. How many have ever had a moment where it just felt right? But then immediately there's something that comes against him. There's this catastrophe. And the queen of the day sends word to Elijah and says, by the way, I'm going to kill you. You know, it's amazing to me that you could have just been the head of the person that, that, that uh, uh, slaughters 400 and then 450 prophets of Baal and Asherah, 850 people. You could have the whole country behind you saying, God, he is the Lord. The Lord, he is God. And they're, they're ready to follow you into battle. And then you get one word from one person and all of a sudden your world crumbles. You know, I don't know about you, but I think that the majority of us have that one person. There's always somebody in our life that's going to be like that wet blanket. You could either, you'd be in the middle of doing something great and be excited about something. You could go home and perhaps it's a family member. You could write a message and perhaps it's your best friend. Something happens and that one person can douse everything. And you feel like you're ready to give up, give in, and not follow through with the plan of God. And that's exactly what happened to Elijah. And so if you've ever experienced that, you're already like Elijah. That's what happened to Elijah. He decides that he's going to run. And he doesn't just run. When he goes, he goes big. I mean, he goes to where he runs out of energy. God gives him more energy. And he travels three days into the desert. And there he finds the Mount of God, you know, Mount Horeb. And there he's going to have this interaction with God. And the first thing that God tells him is, why are you here? Could you imagine that? We want to be like Elijah, and evidently Elijah doesn't do everything perfect. He's human. We are like Elijah over and over again. But what was it that Elijah had that we perhaps lack? And this is what we're going to try to dig into. So I'm going to invite you to go in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be there for just a moment, and then we're going to move into 2 Kings, as that has been our reading this particular week. In 1 Kings 19 and verse 14, it says, he replied, this is Elijah's response. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Now, if you could say that, you're on the right track. You want to be like Elijah. The first thing that you need to have is a passion that nothing is more important to you than God. 
That is going to be the first and major, the, the greatest reason in order for you to be like Elijah. And so here he says, I have been very zealous. You know what? God doesn't say, no, you haven't. No, I think that God says, yeah, I, I agree with you. You prayed, and uh, when I told you to pray, you talked to the, the king. When I told you to talk to the king, you called fire down from heaven to prove that I am the Lord God over Israel. I believe that. You have been very zealous. And I believe that God will say the same thing over our lives as we serve him wholeheartedly. But then he goes on. And he says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. Now, I want to pause for just a moment because what he is saying here is accurate reflection of his emotion, but not accurate information. Not accurate information. As a matter of fact, before he flees, before he has the encounter with all of the prophets of Baal, before he calls fire down from heaven, he has already had an encounter with the king's aide who tells him that he has hidden a hundred prophets of the Lord, 50 in one cave and 50 in another cave. He has already heard this, so he knows that what he's saying is not the truth. But that doesn't change how you feel. How many have ever felt, even when you are serving the Lord, you just feel all alone. Just felt like there's nobody there with you. And this is what Elijah says. I'm the only one left. And then another thing that isn't quite accurate about what he says, it says, and now they are trying to kill me too. Now, that's interesting to me because they are not trying to kill him. There's no they in it. It's the queen. She's the only one that said anything. Everyone else has been fighting alongside of him. Everyone else said, yeah, let's grab the prophets. Don't let them escape. Everyone else was declaring, the Lord, he is God. But somehow, just one person saying just the right thing means that the whole world is against him. I don't know about you, but I've met people that have felt that way. I've been one of those people. That just one person says the right thing, and the whole world crumbles. And that is equi equivalent or equal, equal to what is happening in Elijah's life. And he says this to God. Now, God doesn't respond to him and says, Now, Elijah, tell me the truth. What do you already know? Tell me the truth. You know about those hundred prophets of Baal, don't you? Or a hundred prophets that are serving me, that are, that are guarded off to the side. God doesn't say that to him. And God doesn't say, oh, now, Elijah, who are you? Man, you just called fire down from heaven and you're afraid of that woman? He doesn't do this. God listens to him. And the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Reading on, and it says, when you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nish, Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from Abel Mechola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So God gives him the answer. God gives him a promise. God gives him the hope. He says, no, I'm going to create a team around you. Everything's going to be just fine. And so when we go and we understand this text, we can see that Elijah was stressed out. How many have ever gotten stressed out? You know, you, you get into a position where you're listening to newscasts and you hear that your friends are in danger. I mean, you can have stress because somebody says, oh, this person now has cancer. This person has this problem. And we begin to absorb all of those stresses of life. Just this morning, I received a message from one of the people on our Spanish side saying, please pray for my mother. Uh, just three weeks ago, she had fallen, broken her hip, had to have hip replacement surgery, uh, very elderly. And uh, then today, this morning, she got up in the middle of the night. She has Alzheimer's as well. Got up, didn't remember that she had the replacement hip. Uh, ended up falling down some stairs. Also now has a problem with her knee. And uh, it continues on. And she says, please pray. You know, when you're in the middle of a hospital room, when you're in the middle of, of something that seems devastating and is constant cycle and one thing after another after another. And this is how it's been for Elijah. Remember Elijah, he was the one that says it's not going to rain because I've said it. And God respected that. It stopped at the rain. But then all of a sudden, the brook where he was at dries up. 
You know, how many have ever noticed that sometimes what you say comes back on you too? You know? And he has had moment after moment. He goes in and he says, feed me. He has this stress of having the, the, the widow and her child uh, depending upon him for all of this time. And then later on, the child actually dies. And he, uh, all these things that we see hand in hand with Elijah, we know that he has lived a high stress life. And so Elijah was stressed out by the work. And he was stressed out even though God was doing great things. But that stress had taken its toll on him. He had difficulty standing up to one person. Just that one queen stands up and says something. You know, you could be in a position of stress where all of a sudden just one person says the right thing, just knows right where to push the button, and all of a sudden your world is collapsing. You, congratulations, are like Elijah. You're like Elijah. We may be people who st have difficulty standing up. Jesus said the same thing. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 57, he says, And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. Oftentimes that one person is somebody that's close to you. Oftentimes it's that one person that you allowed to speak into your life and they just devastate you with just one word. Now that doesn't mean that they're always against you. But that's how we, like Elijah, when we are under stress, we need to depend upon God. And God speaks to Elijah. God tells him, Elijah, I want you to go back. I want you to go back. Elijah had, been, had given up. He had said, I don't want anything. He had left everyone and everything, and he had traveled all of this distance into the wilderness, into this desert, just to be at Mount Horeb and say, God, just take me away because I don't want this anymore. Now, that really tells you you're at the stress limit. When you're ready to give it all up, throw in the towel, and you say, I just can't take one more thing, and God says to you these wonderful words, go back. How many of you ever heard those words? I know people that, that they go into a midlife crisis. Maybe that's kind of what Elijah was going into. With all of the stress, he just says, I don't want to deal with any of these things. And when they go into that, all of a sudden, when they come face to face with God, he says, I'm not challenging what you're feeling, but go back. It reminds me of this same story because in the same area in the desert, Moses had left Egypt. He had left Egypt and there he was just tending sheep and he doesn't want to have any of the stresses of Egypt any longer. Matter of fact, they figured that in e the, the people in Egypt figured that Moses had already died. I mean, going out into that desert all alone, he couldn't live for a week, let alone 40 years. And so there he is tending sheep. He's forgotten all about the stresses, all about the, the preparation to be somebody important and official in Egypt. And he's just ready to relax. You could imagine how relaxing it must be or how boring, better said, it must have been to be in charge of watching sheep eat. I'm telling you. I mean, you want, you want to be fascinated with something, you go out and watch sheep eat. Or if you don't have any sheep, it's okay. Just go out and watch the grass grow. Or if you prefer staying indoors, you can watch the tea kettle boil. All of these things are just about the same excitement level. And there Moses was out in the desert for all of this time, and he has just gotten to his, his fill of boredom, I have to imagine. And all of a sudden, he's just looking around. I mean, he's supposed to be watching the sheep. What's he doing looking around? Well, the sheep weren't doing anything. So he looks around, and he sees this fire. And he thinks, that's interesting. You see that, that bush over there? It's burning. It's going gonna, it's gonna to burn up. And he waits for a little while as he would be accustomed to. You see, he didn't have life as we have it, where you could go into your kitchen and turn on a stove and then watch that flame and adjust it to high, medium, and low and adjust it and it stay constant. No, in the day of Moses, they constantly were adding fuel, wood, to a fire and it would go up and then it would go down and go up and go down according to his consumption of the wood. And so he watches this thing because it's exploded into flames and he's expecting it to die down as every fire he'd ever experienced before had. 
But in this particular case, it stays burning. And he says, this is strange. I have to go and check it out. And there with that fire in front of him, he's encountering God. And God says to him the same thing that he's going to tell, tell Elijah. Go back. And just like Elijah, just like Elijah later on will be, Moses is one that says, uh, you know what, that's not a great idea. Send somebody else. I'm not the right one. What if they don't believe me? What if this? And so Elijah hears from God, and God says, go back, go back. The good news is that like Elijah, when we obey God and go back to work, even when it's the middle of the stress level, even when we're in the middle and we say, I've, I've had my fill already. I can't do these things. God will give us a promise. You know what? I propose to you that God already has given us a promise. You know what his promise is? Jesus said it very succinctly. He said this. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the moment of your stresses, in the moment when that one person has said something difficult to you and you feel like giving in, throwing in the towel, when you feel like everything is about ready to collapse around you, God comes along and he says, I have a promise for you. You can go back and you can continue to fight the fight. You can continue to do the battle. Why? Because the battle is not yours, it's mine. I'm just using you. You need to surrender yourself as a, as a servant to the Most High. And God will continue to strengthen. And this is what he tells to Elijah. And he says to Elijah, I got a team for you. And this is what the promise was. God's comfort to Elijah wasn't just one thing, but three Imagine this. He says, go and anoint Haziel, king of Syria, Jehu, king of Israel, and Elisha is the next prophet. Well, we hear that, and that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? How about you? If you're stressed and you're about ready to go back, and God says, I've got the team ready, go back, you're going to be the captain of the team. We get encouraged. We get strengthened. And everything seems like it's going to work fine. But the problem with this is that all the promises are in the future. Now, what do I say? You just read through this last week, and so I, I know this is going to come as a surprise to you, but listen to what it says. In 2 Kings 8, 2 Kings, now we've just moved from 1 Kings 19 to 2 Kings 8. In so doing, we've jumped a couple of decades a couple of decades later, it says this, Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was ill. Now, who is it that goes to Damascus? Elisha. It does not say Elijah, because Elijah is already gone. So Elisha goes, and the king of Aram was ill. And when the king was told, the man of God has come all the way up here, he said to Haziel, Haziel, you recognize that name? That was going to be the king. That's the king that God promised Elijah. Decades later, Haziel isn't even the king yet. Decades later, he says, when he comes, so he said to Haziel, take a gift with you and go to meet the man of God. Consult the Lord through him and ask him, will I recover from this illness? Haziel went to meet Elisha taking with him as a gift 40 camel loads of all the finest wares of Damascus. He went in and stood before him and said, Your son ben Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to ask, Will I recover from this illness? Elisha answered, Go and say to him, You will certainly recover. Nevertheless, the Lord has revealed to me that he will in fact die. He stared at him with a fixed gaze until Heziel was embarrassed. Then the man of God began to weep. Why is my Lord weeping? asked Haziel. Because I know the harm you will do to the Israelites, he answered. You will set fire to their fortified places, kill their young men with the sword, dash their little children to the ground, and rip open their pregnant women. Haziel said, How? Could your servant, a mere dog, accomplish such a feat? The Lord has shown me that you will become king of Aram, answered Elisha. The promise that God gives to Elijah, and I'm pretty convinced that Elijah had already talked to Elisha in the process, because certainly Elisha is in connection with Elijah, knows him, but it's revealed. And so when this guy Haziel comes, he says, God says he's going to recover from the illness, but I know something else. 
I know something else because there was a prophecy about you years ago and you didn't even know about it. God had promised this, this protection to Elijah from a source that was not even going to be existent during the lifetime of Elijah. Congratulations, we live the same way sometimes, don't we? How many generations has passed away saying Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon, and there are some that lose heart. Even now, there are some in our world who are losing their love. The, the love of many has grown cold. We're living in a post-Christian generation now, they say. And the world is hostile to the gospel for the most part. And we still have the promise. Jesus is still the same because he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, I am with you always. I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the end of the age has not yet come. And we're still waiting and we're still uh, the, the church with the promise. And so then Haziel left Elisha in verse 14 and returned to his master. When ben Hadad asked, what did Elisha say to you? Haziel replied, he told me that you will certainly recover. But the next day he took a thick cloth, soaked it in water, and spread it over the king's face so that he died. Then Haziel succeeded him as king. Prophecy? Yes. Promise of God? Yes. Did it come true? Yes. Was it really that helpful to Elijah? I don't know. I don't know. But you know, that was only one of the three. So if we move on in 2 Kings, the next chapter, this is afterwards. In chapter 9, verse 2, it says, when you get there, this is Elisha talking to his servant, sending him. And he says, when you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, don't delay. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, captain, he said. For which of us? All of them were together, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. So again... It was pretty much the same time, the same year. Matter of fact, if you were to do a study on the kings uh, that were there in the time, you'll find out that Haziel became king of Syria in 841 B BC, before Christ. I didn't correct that. I'm sorry. That in Spanish, it's, it's AC, uh, but in English, it's BC. BC. And uh, so 841. Jehu also becomes king of Israel in 841 BC. BC. Now, Elisha began his service as a prophet when? We know that when Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. That's what we know. After that point, because Elisha has asked for a double anointing, a double portion of the anointing of the spirit that Elijah has, he takes the mantle that falls from Elijah as he goes up in a whirlwind, and, he, and he's able to have the power. He smites the river, and he walks across on dry ground again, saying, where is the Lord God of, Israel, uh, of Elijah? And, and so this happens in 852. So Elisha becomes a prophet 11 years before before Hasiel and Jehu become kings in their respective countries. So I have to go back. And I think, well, what does that mean to Elijah? Elijah has a promise from God. God says, go back and do what I'm telling you to do. I've already prepared the team. But the earthly eyes of Elijah never see the team. Again, we're much more like Elijah than we thought. Because God calls us to walk by faith. God calls us to believe the promises. 
the promise of eternal life, and to continue to spread the gospel. And it doesn't matter how we feel at the time. We may be stressed out. We may be over, overrun. We may feel like uh, we're overloaded on t- with too many different things. But God's word comes to us, and he says, go, I have the team in store. You may never be the one to see the team. You may never be able to see all of the great victories that God is promising you. You could see them in your spirit eye, in your, in your spirit. You could imagine what God is going to do. And that's what happens. Very few people are able to see the fulfillment of all of the promises that God has made for them and for their family. You go into people of the Old Testament, like the King David. He was this guy that had all of the favor of God upon him, but he didn't see a lot of the things that God had promised to him. It it wasn't until after King David was dead that the temple was, was built. It wasn't until this, the, the promises later on showed God's faithfulness. And that is a proof to us that God always honors his word. He's always faithful. And even though Elijah could not see what was going on, he couldn't see those promises fulfilled right now. He could say, God, you are a God that honors your word. You are a God that gives promises. And what you did to Moses, you were able to fulfill because it was a promise. And now I can see the history and I can see that you honor your word. He could go in and he could say to God, I see what you promised to David and how you have established that remnant. I know that you're a God that honors your word. So your promise is good enough for me. I don't need to see the people. And that's where we have to be. We have to be the people who see God and know who our God is. And we say, God, you are the one that always keeps your word. You are the one that always honors your promises. And so whether I see it or not, and we can go back now even and look at this promise to Elijah. And say, Elijah, did you have a team? Well, you know what? If you read on, J.Q. was this mighty warrior that went and cleaned house. God did a great work through him. Really did. We can go through and we can see the prophecies and how they were fulfilled exactly. And God did do exactly what he told Elijah. But was it really something that could encourage Elijah in his moment? I don't know. Matter of fact, I doubt it. Because God doesn't want our encouragement to come in the source of other people. Although he uses other people. He puts us in a church so that we could encourage one another. That's why we're told, we're commanded to not forsake the gathering together of the believers because we, are, we can encourage one another. But ultimately, our source for hope, our source for encouragement has to be God. God has visited with me. Elijah has this encounter on the mountain with God where earthquakes and wind and fire and that still small voice. And he says, God, I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you. You are the one that is most important. You are the one that is calling me. God expects the same response from us that he had from Elijah. Elijah obeyed. Oh, Elijah went back and worked. It didn't, he didn't say, I, my stress level is still too high. He went back and said, if God be for me, and I'm waiting for the day of the promise, and the promise is still there. Revelation 22 and 12 says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. God sends back Elijah to do certain things. Now go and find Elijah. Go and do these things. And God sends him back and he follows through and he obeys. And you know what the response was? Elijah didn't die. Elijah didn't die. He went up to heaven in a whirlwind. You know what Jesus promises you? Eternal life. Now think about that. Aren't you much more like Elijah than you thought? Because the same promise is given to us. And Jesus comes along and he says, look, I am coming soon. Now that should encourage us. That should strengthen us. But then we go back and we say, but tomorrow I have to get back to work. But tomorrow and this next day and the week to come, I still have all of the stresses upon me. I still have all of the work to do. And God says, my reward is with me. I'm going to give to each person according to what they have done. I'm watching you right now. The promise is there. But I'm with you. I'm with you. 
If we do not go back to the battle, if we don't engage once again, if we're not willing to stand up and be counted for the gospel, if, we're, if we say, I give up because somebody has said just the wrong thing, my friend has discouraged me just the one time too many, I may not be as gifted, as talented, as, as called as I thought I was. And if you don't go back because that one person or that group of people even have said just that one too many things, then you're not like Elijah. Because Elijah went back. Elijah went back. And Elijah was the one that continued to fight. Elijah returned with nothing but a promise from God. And you know what? That was enough for him. And I ask you, is it enough for you? Is it enough for you that God is watching? Is it enough for you that God is coming to you in a still small voice and saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Is it enough for you in the middle of the stresses and the problems and the things that are going wrong in your life and that one extra word that somebody else has said, and when can you hear God's voice over the middle of all of those things? And God say, look, I'm coming soon. Jesus says, my reward is with me. And so he calls us and he says, don't give up. Now, if we go back into that first text in 1 Kings 19, we continue on because we stopped here in verse 18. And so in verse 19, it says, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha. Now, remember the three promises. Here's the fulfillment of the first one, you would think. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. And he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Here's what he says. Let me kiss my father and, and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Now think about this. You put this into the context of even what Jesus says about a disciple. But Elijah comes and he says, okay, God, finally, you're going to start doing something. And he throws his cloak around Elisha and he says, all right, God, you're starting to form the team. And, and the response that Elisha gives him is not one that he wants. He says, just let me go back and, talk to, uh, and kiss my mom and dad goodbye. And Elisha, Elijah just says, what did I do to you? This is not going to work out. You're not as wholehearted, committed as I thought you were going to be. Something is wrong here. Now, how many have ever looked at when God starts to fulfill his promises and you say, this is never going to work out? We look at it with earthly eyes, don't we? The person gave just the wrong answer. If they would have said it this way, everything would have been fine. But with, with that answer, I don't believe that this is the right person after all. Even if you said it, God... And the reality is that that's what happens. Elisha is not immediately made into this great prophet. He just says, I'll follow you. I'll become your disciple. I'll watch what you do. I'll help you. I'll go and get food. I'll go and get water. I'll go and chop the firewood if you need me to. I'll do whatever you need me to do. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his 12 yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment and cooked the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant, it says. He destroyed his way to go back, and he became his servant. Now, is that what Elijah was hoping for? I don't think so. You know, I think what he was thinking would happen was God was going to put an anointing upon Elisha and then the two of them would be able to fight back to, side to side. You know, they, they would be these, these warriors. But what happens is Elijah goes back. Elijah goes back according to the word of the Lord. He doesn't find the two kings that he's supposed to find to be able to make them part of the team. And the one guy that he can find ends up saying, well, I don't know what we're doing. I'm just here to follow you. Does that sound like a real encouragement? You're like, thanks, God. Now I have two mouths to feed. If my stress level wasn't enough before, now I have somebody saying, why did you do it like that? Can you imagine what was going on in Elijah's mind? But God had promised. 
And there was a point in Elijah's life where he was just saying, Elisha, just stay here. Just stay here with this group. God's called me on to the next group. And Elisha says, no, I'm not leaving you. Just stay here. You never know. Uh, it, it, reading through the scriptures is really hard to decipher the type of relationship that Elijah has with Elisha. It's really difficult. Because until Elijah is gone, Elisha never steps up to do anything. And that was supposed to be the plan of God. You're going to be my team. And all of a sudden it looks like I just have to drag everyone along with me. Thanks, God, for helping me with my stress level. You know? But God does it. Because God is the one that's giving the strength to Elijah. God's going to give the, the promised spirit to Elisha. God's going to anoint Asiel, king uh, of Syria or Aram. And he's also going to anoint Jehu, king of Israel. God's going to accomplish his word. His promises never fail. And so all we have to do is be like Elijah, who continue to fight the fight, continue to battle. God is with us. God is with us, and he's put us together as a church, as Elisha was with Elijah. You know, there's times when that relationship must have been kind of a, a, a drag. It must have been kind of one of those where I feel like I have to do everything in this group. Now, perhaps you've been in a relationship in a church even with that kind of a relationship where you show up and you say, nobody got these there's times when I have people come in and say, there's no offering envelopes, Pastor. Well, go ahead, get them. There's no, uh, and, and we, we prepare beforehand. And there's some that they come in on Sunday mornings. Your, your worship team is here early, and they're prepared, and they're ready to go. And then something happens. Like last week, uh, a week and a half ago, David decided to change his, his big amp into the smaller one because it was easier to carry, I guess. Well, actually, they came back from, my wife came back from worship practice a week and a couple of days ago and said, I don't know what happened to David's amp, but it sounded like a chimpanzee jumped inside of it and was screaming. Uh, and so I, I, it's at the repair shop, and, and um, they're ignoring it as long as they can, and they'll get back to it later. But uh, regardless, regardless, we have things that we have to prepare and do, and there's people that are running here and there. And, then, and sometimes you can get to a place in the ministry where you say, I'm doing all of these things. Why isn't somebody else doing it? But God has each and every one of us in the place where we're supposed to be. Elisha was never supposed to jump up at the moment. He was called to take reins when he took reins. The promise was for Haziel, but it wasn't going to happen until, as we already saw, 11 years after Elijah went to heaven. The promises are there, and the people in the church are being equipped, and we can't look around and say, oh, what's wrong with this? I'm doing all of these things. The fact of the matter is that we work together, and maybe you're a servant, maybe you're a leader, maybe you're the one that speaks up, maybe you're the one that is, is always doing the right thing. I don't know how you may feel in church. But the reality is this, that God has placed us together as a team because we will win in the end. You know how I know that? Because we're the church. If you're part of the church, raise your hand. I'm, a, I'm part of the church. You know what? The church wins. I've read the end of the book. I know. The church wins. You know, sometimes you can read a, a, a mystery, and if you jump too far ahead, you ruin it for yourself. Well, I'm sorry. I jumped to the end, and I know the church wins. And whenever the devil comes against us, like he did against Elijah, to discourage him, it came in the form of one woman, but it could come in the form of any, any sort. It could be one person. It could be a group of people. It could be a circumstance. When the devil comes against you and begins to discourage you, all you have to do is say, I know in the end that we win. And if that's not enough for you, you can remind him of what his end is like too because that's also told to us and that's what we can be because we are like Elijah God expects us to work God expects us to work based on the promise the promise because with God all of his promises are yes and amen and you can count on God 
Bow your heads with me, if you will, this morning.